Welcome to this Institute for Research on Public Policy webinar on the 2021 federal budget. This webinar is made possible in part thanks to Admare Bioinnovations. And I'll leave you with the moderator of today's event and editor-in-chief of Policy Options Magazine, Jennifer Ditchburn. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to an in-depth conversation on budget 2021. I'm coming to you from my home in Ottawa, which is located in unceded Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory. When we talk about the federal budget and we talk about prosperity, growth and opportunity, we should also recognize that we can credit our well-being and our prosperity to the use of land and resources of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. In the case of this territory where my house sits, the land and resources originally covering 47 million acres were never ceded by treaty or otherwise. Let me introduce today's panel. Jasmine Ramsey Razai is the Director of Advocacy and Communications at YWCA Toronto. Charles Breton is the Executive Director of the IRPP Center of Excellence on the Canadian Federation. Hello. Natalia, hello. <laughs> uh, Natalia Mashagina is a Research Director at the IRPP, overseeing the Institute's research program on the future of skills and adult learning. And Colin Busby is also a research director at the IRPP in charge of the programs on the faces of aging and also on the social safety net for working age adults. Hello, everybody. Um, I'll ask you all to take your mutes off just in case. I'm going to kick off our discussion here, but uh, to everybody who's watching, please send along your questions in the Q&A function in Zoom. And we'll get to them uh, as many as possible a little later in the conversation. Si vous voulez poser votre question en français, il n'y a aucun problème, je vais traduire vos questions. So just to kick things off, um, I was going to ask each of you, what, what was your general impression of the budget? How would you characterize this budget document overall? And Jasmine, I'm going to start with you. Um, well, thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. Um, I'm joining you from Treaty 13 territory here in Toronto. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, so this budget contains a transformational investment in childcare. Obviously, it's a, a watershed moment for childcare. And so for that reason, this budget is very exciting to me. Um, you do get the sense that the budget is prioritizing the needs of women and um, and recognizing the value of the care economy. So it, it constitutes, I think, a real win for the women's movement. And it's a budget that contains significant new investments to, to the tune of 100 billion, I believe. And so, you know, some really important investments around combating gender-based violence, housing investments, um, funding for the community services sector and, and more income security support. So these are all great things. Is it um, a budget that goes deep enough to address some of the structural challenges or the systemic issues that the pandemic has exposed? I I'm not entirely certain about that. Um, I think many of the supports introduced are still very time limited, um, but I think broadly speaking, it's a wholly appropriate budget. It's a very generous budget. It's one that contains a strong gender equity lens and um, it inspires hope because it delivers on the promise of childcare. Thank you. Uh, Shell, I'll go to you. You're next yeah, on my I, screen. I, yeah, <laughs> I was going to use uh, similar terms than, that Jasmine just did, but differently. Um, I think it is a reasonable budget with the potential to be transformative uh, for the reason that Jasmine just said, but we need to see that potential realized. And we'll get to those questions later on as to how that childcare program, which is on paper transformative, how, what are the next steps there? What are the potential hurdles? And I'm really looking forward to see how it all unfolds because as I said, I think it has the potential to be really transformative. Natalia? Uh, yes, and I agree with the speakers before me. Um, there are potentials in this budget to be transformative. And as you already heard, my area is adult training. So what can be more transformative than uh, investments in skills? Because that has one of the, or should have one of the best long-term returns to investment uh, for, for different categories of the population. What I found that, that the budget is may seem uh, like it's, it's very detailed. Uh, detailed and it covers lots of areas rather than 
uh, previous budgets that were quite focused on middle class or it was focused on innovation and skills. However, if we think of the purpose of the budget to bring us into a, a kind of new reality to build a new economy for the years to come, maybe that makes sense. And maybe we will discuss more today about what we think about it. Maybe they were stuffing two budgets in one too, since we missed last year's. Uh, Colin, uh, what, what was your overarching impression? Yeah, I mean, I see the budget in two parts, really. I see I see one part of the budget that sees Canada coming out of the pandemic and how to manage the, the, the short term challenges um, of doing so, like supporting provinces, developing stimulus supports to get the economy up and running. And then there's really the second part, which is about tackling medium to long term priorities for Canada. And that's the, the more transformative piece, be it child care, long term care, mental health, income supports, the broader social safety net. And my, my take is honestly, I, ha I have I have, despite, you know, congratulating uh, Minister Freeland for being the first, you know, uh, woman, woman finance minister to table a budget like this. I, I have mixed feelings about both parts of the budget. I think there are things to like and I think there are things to dislike. All right. Well, we're going to dig into that. I'll just say, you know, what strikes me, I've covered many federal budgets over the years, and what strikes me about this budget is the framing of child care as an economic imperative. And I went back to remind myself of the last Paul Martin budget um, in 2005, which was where they talked about the National Child Care Plan, which was shelved by the Conservative government. But it's interesting, the framing of child care in 2005 was completely around um, children and um, giving them an education and a good start in life. And there was almost no mention of women in, uh, in the entire budget document 15, how many years ago? <laughs> 16 years ago. So, um, you know, I, I think that the framing is really interesting. Um, and also, you know, there's overall more recognition, I think, in the document, and this is part of a trend that not all Canadians um, uh, feel economic prosperity in the same ways. So, it seems to me we've gotten sort of a cert over a certain awkwardness about talking about specifically about different groups. So, you know, there's mention in the budget of black Canadians, of bisexual Canadians, of, of less educated Canadians, racialized newcomer women, which is a shift if you look, you know, in past years and decades, uh, there wasn't such a sort of disaggregated uh, look, I guess, at uh, different groups. So Colin, um, enough of me talking. <laughs> uh, can you take us through the um, overarching top line economic numbers and what stands out for you? Happy to. I mean, I mean, the pandemic has obviously had a major impact on public finances across Canada. And, you know, for a starting point, what I looked at is I looked at the prior budget. So the budget, you know, two years ago in 2019 to, to get an understanding of sort of how things have changed from that trajectory that we were on two years ago. And, and at that time, you know, they were projecting, you know, the debt to GDP, the sort of debt to income ratio of, of Canada to be around 30% in the year that we're in now and somewhat declining in the next couple of years. Whereas the current debt, the current budget projects debt to GDP to be over 50% and basically rem remain over 50% in the near term future. And, and despite the sort of short run increase that was absolutely expected as a result of the pandemic, when we look beyond the period of stimulus spending, for instance, when we look at what we were planning in fiscal year 2023-24, in the 2019 budget compared to what we're planning now. So when we kind of remove the stimulus spending from our, from our area of reference, um, you know, what we see is that this budget is planning on spending on being about 50 billion higher per year um, in 2023-24 compared to what was planned in the 2019 budget. So there's been a significant ratcheting up in the long-term commitments by the federal government of, of Canada, even when excluding stimulus measures. And the other thing I know, too, is that the economic backdrop is extremely volatile in the short run. Um, and when you look at how things change, even just compared to the fall economic statement, um, we can see just it's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Um, the economy just today, just in this in, in the current year, is already expecting to grow by over two percentage points uh, bigger than what it was in the fall last year. And, and notably as well, um, the fall economic statement set up uh, new fiscal guardrails that were put in place to basically help guide the size and the length of the stimulus. Um, and they basically are things like the employment rate, the unemployment rate, and the hours worked of Canadian workers. And when you look at those, I mean, employment rates are just 1.3% lower than the, what they were the pre-pandemic, and hours worked are something similar. 
So it's easy to see an economic rebound happening and happening quickly, especially once things like travel, tourism, arts and food service sectors pick up again. So all of that, I think, brings into question the, the degree of the stimulus measures needed and the longevity of them. Uh, Colin, just to follow up, is there anything there that you see as a sort of a dark cloud economically? <laughs> it's it's easy to be pessimistic under the current circumstances. I you know. Um, yeah, but, I live you in know, Ontario. What, <laughs> 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 so, well, yes. I, <laughs> but what I would say is, I, I mean, I think that there's a few things that 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 jump out. I mean, I'll mention two. So one, I think, is the share of unemployed Canadians who've been out of a job for more than six months. It's a figure that remains stubbornly high, and those levels are about 2.5 times higher than what they were pre-pandemic. The other thing I want to point out, too, is that, is that the short-term economic projections that are in the budget, you know, even under sort of the more pessimistic or, or, or optimistic scenarios, they rely heavily on the attainment of 80% vaccination coverage in Canada by the summer. Uh, and, and that in of itself is going to be a monumental challenge. So, so much of the economic plans and forecasts that are built into this, um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty there. They might not arise if we're not successful in achieving our public health objectives. And that, that, that complicates both the short and the longer term components of this fiscal plan. I think when you, sorry, if I can jump in, I think when yep. you were saying that there are two parts in that budget, I think that's a really great way of seeing it, right? So what the measures that are taking you over the hump, like, so we're past the, the, the pandemic and the measures after that. But depending on how long it takes to actually get to the second part, the second part might, some of the second part might have to get out the window because of what the first part will have cost. I was listening to Minister Freeland this morning, the question like some of these measures have, have been extended up to September. Um, so what happens after that, if we need to extend again? And she was clear, if we need to extend them again, we will. Uh, but like, depending on how long that goes, then after that, there are measures at the end that, that might, uh, uh, that might not be there when we get there. I noticed that there, that the uh, minister and others uh, often frequently reference the last economic crisis in 2009 and, and uh, you know, not making the mistakes of 2009. And there has been some analysis that, you know, austerity measures were brought in too quickly um, and uh, there could have been more growth had they not um, cut into spending so much uh, after that but we're in such a different picture, right? Uh, I don't think that you can't compare the kind of economic crisis we were in back in 2008 and 2009 and the one we're in now, which is so dependent on, on, the, on the pandemic and the vaccine rollout. Um, Jasmine, um, the headline obviously of this budget is uh, childcare <laughs> um, with an investment of 30 billion over five years and then permanent spending of 8.3 billion annually. How significant is this and will it actually make a difference in terms of daycare spots? And I, I, I'm particularly interested in this because when my kids were, were young, um, it, uh, and I was, I think, at one point paying $22,000 uh, a year in childcare, um, there, I, it was like a blood sport to find spot. Um, I mean, you, 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 I remember we slept overnight one night to try to get an after-school spot for our kids. So, you know, give us a sense overall of what, what you make of the child care uh, promises and whether there, there will be an impact on the all-important issue of spots. Right, yeah. I mean, uh, off the bat, I mean, it's a huge number. So kudos to the, the Liberal government for coming up with such a substantial number in terms of its investment, because it really does take into account the sort of uh, mammoth patchwork system of childcare that exists across Canada. And it recognizes the challenge ahead, which is like now how to operationalize this plan and get the provinces on board and all of that. So, and, and you know that budgets are aspirational. So, I mean, I think it's all yet to be determined how it'll play out. But yeah, I mean, to your point, I think it's interesting that they had specific targets or measures of success in terms of affordability with like the 50% reduction by the end of 2020, 2022, and then um, $10 per day on average childcare within five years. Um, kind of modeling off of Quebec. So that's great. But then when it came to like in terms of um, spots and how they expect that to grow, the budget was very vague or kind of silent on that. So it will be interesting to see how the money will lead to the actual creation of greater childcare spots, because to your point, it's not just an affordability issue, it's an accessibility issue. And um, particularly in rural areas, 
it's harder to, to access those types of spots, uh, let alone in the city for a completely different reason. But, um, and also I think another piece about the childcare, I think that's worth mentioning is that the budget kind of talks about nonprofit childcare and like the importance of decent work, but it's also kind of vague around it. Um, it's referenced, but um, nothing was concretely offered. And really what we're hoping for is a publicly funded, high quality, affordable childcare system that also pays its workers, right? The majority of whom are women, a decent wage and values the childcare workforce. A lot of childcare advocates are raising attention to the fact that these frontline workers who are providing an essential service, a really important service to the you know, growth of Canada, the future generation of Canada are being paid a notoriously low wage. So we're hoping for um, more spots, um, greater affordability, affordability, but also uh, better wages for childcare workers. Let me just ask you, um, we're now into the, the fifth cycle of a budget that talks about um, a gender-based analysis, gender-based analysis mm -hmm. plus. Do you see um, this making a material difference in, in programming and on impact, or are we still at the stage of words and, and rhetoric? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a really it's good a, question. It's a big question. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, I, and, you know, language serves many functions. It, it can be an idea to share information, to invoke an emotion. And I, so I think the language of the budget certainly reflects a certain worldview. And I don't think it's just lip service. I think it reflects a genuine desire to create gender equality in Canada, but you know, in a way that's still profitable and supportive of economic growth within the framework of a market economy. And so feminists are not a monolith and the, the GBA plus tool is a, I think a flawed tool like many tools are, but it's still a very useful one. And throughout the budget in all areas, you're seeing this lens informing uh, budgetary decisions, right? Sometimes in a very granular way even. So I, I thought the narrative does signal kind of this shift and this commitment by this government. I think it does deliver some significant changes in some areas, childcare being one example, but also in like employment and training, there's this gender lens in entrepreneurship, there's this gender lens even in some of the income su support pieces. So the lens is there and I think it, it has led to some more concrete changes for sure. Thank you. Natalia, your, your area of expertise is in uh, adult skills and, and training. Um, can you give us a sense of what elements in that in the budget stood out for you in that in that realm? Uh, yes, um, just to remind our uh, viewers in case they didn't uh, maybe see the, the full picture from the from the numbers presented this year's budget announces quite a big chunk of money devoted to training, although it's over the next five years. I believe it's two and a half billion dollars just for adults. Um, and I think on top of that, there is another $365 million to uh, extend the already existing schools bo uh, skills boost program that allows working age adults go full time back to, to university. Um, what was interesting this year is that I saw a few initiatives that have been on top of everybody's mind, so to speak. For example, we often hear that um, all the policies, all the initiatives that have been introduced recently, they encourage people to invest in their skills. So transferring the responsibility on, on them, for example, Canada training benefit is specifically for individuals to invest in training. However, uh, employers tend to be omitted from the picture. So uh, this year's budget actually mentions employers quite a bit. Uh, they, there are many ways to bring employers to, 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 to help or force employers to invest in training of their employees. But what these initi initiatives suggest is to work with employers to determine what programs, what skills, uh, what skills are needed, what jobs. So there is quite a number of initiatives that are trying to link employers with uh, training organizations or uh, with communities that identify the needs of high potential employers in their, in their area. 
uh, and to, to link it with individuals who need this kind of training or who are looking for jobs. So that was very interesting. And especially when uh, the initiatives talk about employers, they specify small and medium sized businesses because we know that that's the, the prevalent number of businesses in Canada are small. And uh, these are the, the, uh, the companies, the, the firms that have most difficulty providing training to their employees. Uh, so some of these initiatives are timely and I'm glad to see small businesses to be emphasized and affected by these. There's, there's also um, money in the budget for apprenticeships. Um, is that yeah. significant? Uh, yes, yes, this is a very interesting one, and um, I'm glad that we can spend a bit of time talking about it because apprenticeship has been, it's a, it's a, it's a high potential uh, way to get very good income for lots of people, but enrollment in apprenticeships has been low. Um, there was a study that we issued uh, in February this year. It was done by uh, Statistics Canada researchers Rene Morissette and uh, Theresa Hankin Chu that show that even in the most recent recession, in the middle of it, people who lose their jobs, they do an array of different things to get back on their feet, but apprenticeship, enrollment in apprenticeship is not one of the strategies that they employ. And what's worse is that starting 2014, enrollment in, in, in apprenticeships started falling. That's related to the oil prices bust that we, uh, that we experienced. And what's interesting is that in 2020, enrollment in, in apprenticeships fell even further. Just to give you an idea, um, I think enrollment fell by half in 2020 compared to 2019. In 2019, it fell only by 3% compared to 2018. So this is the area that really, really needs help. You can argue whether what's proposed in the budget is sufficient or not, but at least I see it as a first step. And just to remind you, uh, the funding is proposed to match apprentices in their first year from certain sectors to employers, especially small, again, small and medium-sized businesses. And these businesses are encouraged to hire apprentices, especially uh, the, the incentive that's proposed to businesses doubles if apprentices come from underrepresented groups. So uh, again, it's over five years, whether it's sufficient or not, we will see and we can argue, but I'm glad to see it as a first step. And what's important here is not just to provide training and just to release people in the free world, but we see more and more that training that works and we will have a study coming up in May about new interesting approaches to training. We see that training shows results and it helps people do better when uh, skills that people receive are matched to employers' needs and people are matched to employers that are able to take them right from their training program and put them to work. So I think this is the right step, uh, but we need to see how it's, how it's implemented and how it unravels. Thank you. Uh, so so skills and training, shall, uh, mental health, long-term care, child care, there's sort of a common thread here, which is <laughs> they're all areas of, that the provinces have jurisdiction over. Um, can you take us through what you, you see might be the sort of more controversial side of the federal budget, which is, you know, in intergovernmental affairs? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's actually that what's controversial is not necessarily controversial, but the, the one thing that all provinces this morning are not happy about is that there is no change to the Canada health transfer, which was expected. We didn't expect that to be part of the budget, but that was really what they were clamoring for before it. Uh, these discussions will continue, but in effect, um, the Canada health transfer not only will not increase, it will decrease because this year it was uh, uh, increased by $4 billion just for this year because of COVID. And that once that $4 billion uh, um, uh, disappears, then next year they're, they're looking at, le at, at, at transfers that will be uh, lower. Um, so that was expected, and that's what we saw. Um, other than that, I mean, the one thing that could have been really controversial was long-term care. It's still controversial, but there's there's really nothing 
concrete in the budget that provinces can really complain about basically it's the same thing it's standards but we still don't know what those are or don't know what the strings that will be attached to that we don't know what they are exactly so of course provinces are again saying that most provinces um, uh, quebec to name one uh, still saying that they will not agree to national standards in long-term care because it is a provincial jurisdiction but in effect, in the budget, we, it's still not clear what that will look like. Um, uh, the federal government is still signaling is it, it, its desire to do so and to move forward with that. So I think we'll need to 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 uh, to follow to see uh, uh, um, what exactly concretely that th those standards are or and what shape it takes. Uh, I, uh, there's the other thing on long-term care is about data. I think everyone will agree that that's welcome in the sense that uh, everything related to health data, uh, um, there's always that we, we can spend more to make sure that we have the correct data to make the decisions that we we need to take in that field. So uh, I, I don't think that provinces will really complain there. On childcare, I mean, this will, I mean, this is massive. I mean, you talked about the, Mar the, the, the Martin program. That was something like five billions over five years. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking 30 over five years with like 8.7 yearly after that like it's it's a completely different ballpark so uh it it will be provinces agreed and they're the the, the martin dryden team was able to strike a um a, a deal with all provinces on that on that past program um i don't see how provinces can um uh, it'll It'll be much more difficult for provinces to um, uh, disagree with this new program in the sense that there's so much money, it's so much, it's so massive that the pressure from inside the provinces to just sit at the table and listen and, and uh, will be will be uh, gigantic. Even in Quebec, I mean, uh, of course, the Quebec government is really happy with this because it's clear from the from the get go that like they'll just get money. There might be some. Uh, restrictions. One restriction might be to make sure that this not, doesn't go into general revenue and that is actually used for daycare. But mm -hmm. even then, the pressure within Quebec to actually use it for childcare will be massive because, yes, the federal government is signaling that it wants to uh, uh, use Quebec as an inspiration. But the system in Quebec needs money now. And the, the CAC government was looking to improve it because there are shortcomings. There, the Places here are as hard to get. Uh, places here in CPR, the actual um, um, uh, public funded, publicly funded uh, um, network, are hard to come by even in Montreal. Um, and so uh, um, this kind of solves the problem for the government, but also all points to the fact that um, they'll want to use it for that. So they're 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 happy with this announcement. I'm really looking forward to see how the negotiation negotiation unfold. Um, uh, uh, because again, each province has kind of a specificities to what it wants to do. Uh, and so we'll see how it goes. BC, for instance, was already kind of moving towards a system like that. So that gets them over the hump and they'll be able to do what they wanted to do. Places like Ontario who have, um, uh, kindergarten for four-year-olds, like how does that fit into, uh, the equation right here for four-year-old, you need to send your many places you need to send your kid to childcare, not in Ontario. So how does that mm -hmm. figure out in, in, in the system? Um, uh, so I'm really looking forward to see how, how, how it all uh, unfolds on, in that regard. But again, like I said at the beginning, this has definitely has the, the, the potential to be, uh, to be transformative. Just, uh, you know, picking up on that point about, um, you know, the, 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 the dynamic between the provinces and the federal government, Colin, you know, we, we had a discussion yesterday about this, just about fiscal room and how much room the federal government is taking up on that. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, in Canada, there's, there's one taxpayer. And, and, and what matters most is that in Canada is the joint, provincial, the joint fiscal situation of the federal government and the provinces. And, and prior to the pandemic, and, and really even now, I mean, the major medium to long run, you know, public finance concern in the country was, how the provinces were going to deal with an aging population and the increase in healthcare costs, plus the lower economic growth rates that come from that. Um, you know, at the time, pre-pandemic, the feds were in, you know, really, really good shape over the longer run um, with spending that at the federal level that was less sensitive to those demographic pressures in the provinces. And, you know, now with the higher spending trajectory of the federal government, 
potential feasible options to sort of solve the, the spending crunch that was going to be facing the, the provinces in the longer term, like tax point transfers, like lowering the GST and encouraging the provinces to take up the space. They're just frankly much more unlikely to arise. And so, so the provinces, you know, still need solutions for how they're going to fund um, um, their demographically sensitive programs, healthcare for an aging population. And so it's a big issue that still needs solving. And, and, and the solutions really aren't, aren't, aren't here in this budget. And, and so, it, it, you know, to, to tie it back to sort of, you know, some of Charles' points, I mean, it seems to me like, like what this is going to culminate with in a lot of these sort of Fed prov discussions is going to be a little bit of, of horse trading. So it's going to be like, OK, well, the federal government's priority is child care. And you know what? The, the, the provinces have their own complicated priorities. They have long term care reform on the agenda. They've got a number of backlogs in health care surgeries. They've got educational delays. They've got you know, a, a whole assortment of other priorities that now we're going to have to fit child care into that agenda. And I just think it's going to culminate with a very large, you know, with a very large ask in terms of, of transfers for health or other just general transfers. And that's sort of going to be the horse trade that needs to take place in order for the to solve basically the, the province's problems now and in the longer run, mm -hmm. and at the same time accomplish the federal government's agenda. I mean, just to go back on to that, like in the fiscal update from the fall, they, the, the federal government did change the fiscal stabilization program, which will provide some funding to provinces. But this is this is minuscule compared to the Canada health transfer, which the province really want to see increased. So, uh, and equalization is the other big transfer, but equalization won't help provinces this year because there's a lag in the years that we're calculate that we're using to calculate equalization payment. So they'll see that money in, in two three years down the line. So uh, for next year and maybe the year after, uh, provinces will still be uh, clamoring for increases in Canada health transfer primarily. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jasmine, I wanted to ask you, um, there's, you know, something that might not have gotten a whole lot of attention in, in, in media is something in the budget um, for the Community Services Recovery uh, Fund, $400 billion, which is a decent chunk of money. Can you talk about why um, that sector was asking for help and what difference it would make? Sure, yeah. Um, imagine Canada, uh, YMCA Canada, YMCA Canada, and a few other leading um, national nonprofit organizations um, have been working closely with the government and advocating for funding for our sector, the nonprofit sector and charitable sector, um, because our sector has really been impacted by COVID. So over half of the sector um, is reporting declines in revenues. Um, the average shortfall is somewhere around 43%. And so what this means is that if, if nonprofits can't raise enough funds for their programs, they have to either close their doors or scale back their programs, right? And um, the women's sector as a particular subsector is really vulnerable in this. Um, uh, for example, national survey that YWCA Canada did in December suggested that, you know, uh, Half of half of the women's sector has had to, had to actually scale back certain programs, and the other half had to cut back some critical services. So, um, because we support communities that face poverty, violence, and are really marginalized in various ways um, because of structural really inequities, um, if if we can't operate, that doesn't really bode well for the communities that we support. Um, so the measures that the budget laid out um, really support charities and nonprofits it, it is really unprecedented, actually. And so the, the government really listened to uh, our sector and tried to support our sector and the contributions that it has committed to are significant. Um, you know, like if we think about um, even say the organization that I work at, we provide employment and training supports. We have pre-apprenticeship programs for women, three in fact. And we recognize, for example, that if one out of five jobs in Ontario is gonna be in the skilled trades, women need to access this, right? So if we can't operate, then all of our programs, like our childcare programs and employment programs or settlement programs or housing programs are at risk. And so it's, it's a great amount. Um, you know, perhaps even more is needed. I'm not sure. It's, 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 it's not clear to me. But I mean, I think it will, it will go a really long way to support our sector, and I think it's super important. So very grateful for that. 
I think we forget that the, the community services sector is part of the social safety net and, uh, and without those, you know, trying to plug holes that the, that the federal and the provincial safety nets aren't, aren't um, filling. Um, and Jasmine, um, there's also money for uh, a national strategy on gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. um, what's the significance of that, uh, especially in the context of, of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, another uh, a huge and significant investment. I mean, gender-based violence is a long-standing issue in Canada um, that predates the pandemic. But we've seen a spike in violence in various areas of the country because stay-at-home orders essentially trap women in households that are not always safe. So, um, I mean, I think it was a U the UN that actually pointed out that the home is still one of the most unsafe places for women. So we we've seen an, a spike a national spike in gender-based violence somewhere between 20 to 30 percent. The budget even mentions it's the budget itself mentions that 83 percent of frontline workers have seen a spike in both frequency and severity of violence. And so um, the sector, the women's sector, has been calling for a national action plan on gender-based violence for many years now. And in 2017, the government signaled its support for such a plan with its uh, gender-based violence strategy. And, and so it, the government is working towards creating this national action plan to end gender-based violence. Um, community consultations actually only wrapped up recently. And so this $600 million in investment is part of the process of creating a national action plan. And it's super important because gender-based violence needs a whole of government approach. It is an issue, it is a social issue that intersects with many others, right? And so it's, it's heartening to see women's organizations being funded, survivors having more access to supports, and some of the beginnings of certain judicial reforms. Like I'm not a, a legal expert, so I can't fully comment on that, but I think all of these things are, are really steps in the right direction and, and so needed in, during this critical time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to questions in a couple of minutes, but um, let me just ask you, Natalia, um, overall about the, the coherence of the government's skills and training agenda. Um, do, you, do you feel that the government has sort of like a, a kind of systems approach to it and a good sort of cohesive approach to how they, they're looking at skills and, uh, skills and training for adults? Well, before I uh, answer this question, we should keep in mind that actually training, especially training for unemployed, underemployed workers is provided and delivered by provinces. It's a provincial jurisdiction. What the government does, usually the federal government, is it provides funding to the provinces. So it's very hard to expect them to have um, um, you know, a strategy or to have a, an agenda, to speak of it as an agenda. I think the closest to, to real agenda we had back in 2017 when uh, the funding was rethought to labor market development agreements, there were some changes of how, how it was the, the eligibility who's, who can be covered. So if I want to talk about that, I would probably refer to the budget of 2017. Uh, but what the, the, the federal government can do is to fund additional, either provide additional funding, and that's what we see in World Economic Statement, or what they do this time, they fund very specific programs. Um, they are limited in scope, so we see a particular sector or a particular group of workers or particular group of businesses that are being affected. So I wouldn't call it... Um, it, it may appear patchy, it doesn't appear like a system, but I think given how the system works, this is what they could do. I think they could have done better in terms of people transitioning between sectors because we cannot just uh, emphasize on people who lost their jobs because some people may, may still go, go back to jobs, but their sector will be so shaken that they will have to look for something else. Uh, we hear about uh, like anecdotal stories about people who leave the service sector, even though they didn't lose their job, but they see that the service sector is no longer uh, this very safe sector. We used to think of services as an area that you cannot outsource, so they cannot be moved to China. You, you, it's hard to automate. Nobody wants to go to a robotic hairstylist. So we used to talk about services this way, that they are safe, and now we experience that 
that's the sector was hit the most. And uh, I personally know quite a number of people who want to, you know, uh, move somewhere else, somewhere maybe more safe, somewhere, some growth sectors. So I think they could have done better in terms of move, helping people who want to change their jobs, even though they, they have the job right now. Um, the energy sector is another transforming sector that they do mention, but I think the number of people that could be receiving help is much smaller than the number of people who will need help. Because if we want to move to clean energy, we need to think of people who work in traditional energy sector right now. Are there jobs for them, given their skills and experience? Is there something for, for them to do in the new clean, uh, clean energy world? Uh, but go to go back to your question, um, I think well they did what they did and uh, it's hard to do something more systematic given that the the the, the system doesn't allow for that so thank you well i um i we've got a lot of questions so i'm going to start going through a few of them um one here that we have is what are your thoughts on the excess government spending and the massive debts that this government has accumulated how will the government deal with the massive deficits except for increasing tax? Colin, maybe I'll, I'll throw that one to you. Well, it's a, and, uh, a tough Sorry, one. I'm gonna add one, one, one bit to that, which is what, what happens if interest ri rates rise to even 2%. Anyway, <clears throat> there you go. <laughs> I mean, look, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty with respect, again, both in the short and the long term in, in, in this budget document. And I think it's, that has to be articulated. And, and there's, there's, when it comes to, you know, the pressures on public debt, um, you know, I, I'm going to go back to a bit to an earlier point I made. And, and that really is that, you know, what we're looking at at the end of the day is, is joint federal provincial uh, um, finances and how they're looking at longer run. Um, and when it comes down to it, again, it's, it's the provinces that are facing the most financial pressure in the longer run. And, and you know, to the extent that there's fiscal, you know, space to occupy out there, um, be it, you know, by increasing taxes um, or not, I mean, the, the reality is that it, it becomes more complicated when you've got, you know, the federal government wanting to, you know, maintain its presence and its its size of the uh, of the overall pie in the economy going forward, whereas the provinces are the ones that are really going to need space just to maintain the existing levels of funding and of, of spending that we have. So, you know, we've talked a lot about social programs and the importance of social programs and how they matter, and they do. We also need to be able to, to ensure that we can finance them in a way that is, is sustainable over the longer run. And the federal government issues are distinct from the provincial government ones. And so we end up sort of coming back to this question as to how you're going to balance the two and how the two levels of government are at the end of the day going to work together in terms of their ability to finance these things and to finance them. So, you know, when it comes to interest rate pressures, you know, the, the issue is that, you know, we don't know if there's a problem until the problem actually happens. So there's, there's, there's no way of us knowing in advance. We're going to know, we're going to know later. Um, but the place to watch, in my opinion, and the place to really think about is provincial governments and provincial bond markets and provincial debt markets and sort of how they react going forward, because I think that that is, is, is going to be much more indicative of, of the perspective as to, okay, how well are Canadian governments situated to finance um, um, the ongoing costs of government programs. And you know what? It's okay to talk about, you know, the GST and to talk about GST increases. I mean, in, in, this, in this government, I mean, let's face it, like, I mean, EI premiums are scheduled to go up by 20% on workers and on employers in the coming five years. I mean, that's just the reality. So there, it, you know, there's, there's, there, there's room to discuss these things. And I think that, you know, the other issue I'd throw on the table too is a question of intergenerational and intergenerational quality. Those are, 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 are pressing issues that as a society that we have to deal with. So much of the long-term costs in terms of, of the employment outcomes of this pandemic are gonna come out on young people. And, and yet so much of, the, of the, 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 the financing is for current consumption today. Um, so, you know, these are all complicated things that we need to keep our eye on. But, but even on, like, it, just thinking about the large, like the large debt and the large deficit for the last year and this year, like, at this point, like, we're still, at the, I, to me, it's still too early to think about that because there's a crisis that we need to respond to. And we're still we're not out of it. So these measures that are costing a lot now that are extended to cover for to, to try to phase the pandemic, 
I, to me, there's no other option at that point. Yes, the childcare one is a huge thing that will cost a lot in the coming years. That's the one. That's one thing. But there, a lot of the costs in that budget that increase the debt are costs that seriously we can't really avoid because we need. We're, we're still facing that pandemic. Mm. If I may, add, on, yep. yeah. If I may add, I think you know all of this to me is sort of indicative of path dependency. If 50 years ago childcare was funded in the way that healthcare was, and that was due to specific political reasons and movements and all of this that had very socialist, frankly, leanings, right? We wouldn't be in the situation that we are today. So even though we're making investments today, the idea is even though the debt may increase and yes, there's, we have to consider these things, the long-term consequences of us not taking action on some of these issues are also things that maybe we can't easily quantify, but have long-lasting impact. Like there is a long-lasting impact of not having a robust, well-funded childcare system of women not having access to, to daycare. So it's an investment today and hopefully future generations will reap the benefits of that. And I think, you know, <laughs> It's hard to say whether it's, it's, I guess all of this to say is that if we don't deal with certain problems today, the problem will expand in scope and develop tentacles and be a much bigger thing later on. And childcare is actually a perfect example of this, of a patchwork, inadequate system that has exploited workers and has left a lot of women in very precarious situations. And so we need to address social issues now it's going to be expensive, but it really is to the benefit of future generations. And, and just to, again, on childcare, I just want to add one thing. And Jennifer, you talked about how it's framed in the budget uh, around growth and about economic growth. That's not just framing. And it's not just like a political way of trying to sell the idea. There's research behind that too, of the economic effect of a system like that one, that in the end, maybe doesn't completely pay for itself, but almost. So, um, um, and that, I mean, this is not, baked into the into this budget on the revenue side for sure but um, um that's something to keep in mind well and you have chambers of commerce that canada business council and others who who are net backing child care as a, as a driver of economic growth mm -hmm. um jasmine just to pick up on on what you were talking about uh, we have a question here about do you think that this budget recognizes and effectively responds to increasing inequality generation generated by the pandemic does it provide opportunities for moving, returning to normal versus creating a new normal? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm not entirely convinced that it does. And I'm not suggesting that necessarily it needed, the government needed to spend more money. It's not about that. I think it's, um, th there might be, okay, so I I'm not a, a tax, you know, expert. But I've heard and I've read articles and reports around how Canada's tax system needs reform, right? There are many programs that actually need reform. And I think we need stronger labor market protections and we need to understand and value the care economy in a different way than we do now. And I don't see that to that extent being reflected in the budget. And maybe the budget isn't the most appropriate document for that because there's some politics here too. But in any case, I, I don't think it goes far enough. I think it contains some really great new investments. Um, but from where I sit and from the issues that we see, we're seeing a, a, a heightening of, of poverty and inequality and violence. And, you know, from the folks that I speak to and the communities that we serve, a time limited measure isn't really there to support them. Um, had the Liberal government introduced a basic income program, which I know is very controversial, and I'm sure not everyone agrees, but like something of, of those lines, like the Canada Disability Benefit, I think that has more teeth and has greater impact, but we've seen a little bit less, l less of those types of, of transformative changes. So I don't know if it fully does address some of the, the, the root causes of the inequities that exist in particularly our labor market. Thank you. Um, Natalia, I have a question here about adult learning, uh, adult skills and learning. Um, many provinces offer free upskilling programs for their citizens, especially in Atlantic Canada. Canada has a large untapped labor force, but these individuals have not been eligible for the training incentives in the past as they target people with strong transferable skills um, or youth. 
how do we change the conversation to include them? Well, it's an, it's an excellent question. Uh, there, I think there's lots of categories of, of adults that are not uh, getting access to training they need. There is lots of people who don't know, and that's a big, big issue that they don't know that they may be eligible for training, for free training. And that goes a lot to people with low literacy or numeracy skills. This year's budget does mention uh, this issue. Uh, literacy and numeracy skills training now is, um, basically they're funding community organizations that may provide literacy and numeracy skills to marginalized groups. But again, it's, it's very small and it doesn't change doesn't change the picture that it's not a solution. So I agree with the question. Um, and it goes back to what we've been talking for the last, I don't know, 10 years. How do we, how we do, how do we rethink eligibility and uh, how do we inform people and how do we fund all of these programs that are at the provincial level, but we, we're not discussing the federal budget. How do we bring it all together? And as I mentioned, uh, lack of awareness uh, by many adults of what they can obtain and can obtain for free is a big issue. And for different kinds of training, there is also um, a negative stigma for people to say, well, this is, this is what I'm lacking or this is what I need to do. And they don't express it to their employer, for example. They're afraid to be fired. Uh, they don't express it to their family. They wouldn't even advertise that they are going to improve their literacy skills, even though they have uh, a diploma, for example. I, I keep thinking of literacy for, for some, somehow I had this association of the question with this topic. But there, there are lots of issues here involved and uh, you know, we've been talking about this. Lots of people are talking about this, but it's a quite a complex issue. But I agree with the, with the viewer who raised this question. Thank you. I have a, a question from uh, Sherry Torchman. Hello, Sherry out there. Um, what did you think about the enhancement to the Canada Workers Benefit? Colin, maybe I'll ask you about that. Great question. I mean, for starters, I, I, I very much welcome the priority and the attention that's given in that, that expansion towards uh, single persons. So, um, you know, the RPP research, and I recommend that you, you, you take a look at it. I mean, it, it has, you know, documented in some detail, as have many others, how much single person, so basically single per person households, people living alone, how you know significant the challenges that they face both when it comes to the the risks of falling into poverty but especially deep poverty and, and this is just frankly a group of of canadian citizens that hasn't gotten the kind of political attention that um that seniors or that um, um you know parents have gotten when it comes to fixing the holes of the social safety net so what happened was, is that they, they expanded the income range at which people could access, you know, um, benefits and basically the, the Canada's workers benefit for those who don't know it's, it's a, it's a top up, it's an income top up for those who earn low wages. So, you know, generally the way it works is for if you're, if you're earning in and around the minimum wage, um, working part or full time that you can, you can, you can gain access to these benefits, but for single persons, I mean, for those working minimum wage, working full time, you wouldn't have been able to access this program prior to this budget. So now a lot more singles, single people who are, are working, earning minimum wage are going to get access to it. I think that's a I think that's a real interesting um, initiative. I think there's probably some details around the rollout of it that can be improved over time. But I welcome the attention. And I, I think it's 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 a, a kind of a bit of a sleeper change in it. It's it's going to cost roughly one point eight billion dollars per year um, now going forward. Um, I, I think that's great. You know, I, I, I would have loved to see, you know, potentially that 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 even get expanded further. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a recognition of a problem that has gone unrecognized, and it's a step in the right direction. The workers' benefit is one of those, uh, one of those initiatives that had um, very sort of cross-partisan support over the years uh, because of, of, of its effectiveness. Um, I'll, I'll take one more question. I'm going to wrap up soon, and it's about pharmacare. Um, Shall uh, the, the question is, is it the national plan dead? 
it certainly was it's certainly sort of not like... a it's <laughs> certainly not a priority now. Uh, that's pretty clear. Um, uh, yeah, so I think I think the focus has clearly shifted um, away from it. Um, I mean, the, the, the pandemic is not um, the pandemic is, a, I think, is a reason for that. Uh, because it brought the focus on long-term care. So, I mean, at some point, the government needs to decide where it'll focus it, its energy. Uh, so it appears that it'll be on long-term care and child care. And for long-term care, I think this is definitely due to the pandemic. That's where that's where the focus is coming from. Thank you. Sorry, go on, uh, Colin. Oh, if, if I could add too, I mean, I mean, I think that obviously, you know, some of the 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 the, the importance of what might Mike the child care initiative more successful than the pharma care one was that uh, the, the, the child care initiative doesn't require Quebec to change anything. Whereas the mm -hmm. pharma care initiative, even though Quebec does have universal pharma care coverage, that was not the plan that the, the federal government had, had planned to lay out for the rest of the country. Therefore, it would require Quebec to change its, its pharma care coverage plans. Um, to make a broader point, you know, you've, you've got pharma care, you've got, you know, long-term care reforms, you've got mental health, you've got child care. And it, it's quite clear to me that, you know, there's going to have to be a shakeup as to how, sort of how these priorities are going to balance out on federal and provincial agendas going forward. And, and if there's one thing that I would add to that is that the pandemic has showed us when it comes to joint jurisdiction in healthcare, it is clear that clear lines of accountability are desirable. Mm -hmm. Not situations that result in finger pointing between levels of government. So whatever gets decided on these files going forward, it would be really nice if we could come to some sort of financing, conditional structure where we know who to blame when there's problems. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm going to just like do like a, a quick round. Um, so very, very briefly, I have the, the last question I have for all of you is the budget's always like chalk block with like interesting bits that don't get much attention. Can you tell us like very, very quickly, what's the bit that, that you wanted to highlight that stood out for you? Uh, Natalia. It won't be related to training, surprise, surprise. I talked about training a lot today, but I'm interested in innovation, science and technology. So I always check that section. And I realized that now we have a national quantum strategy. So uh, I know for a lot of people who are not maybe uh, in this area, it sounds like sci-fi coming <laughs> to our life, just like AI came to our lives a few years ago. But it's quite interesting because indeed there is quite a bit of research in Canada in this area. There are a lot, uh, quite a number of researchers in Canada who are also doing applied research to, to, to look for applications in industry and there, there, there are companies who work on quantum computing. So I thought that's a very interesting area and I was a bit disappointed that uh, nobody picked it up picked up on that. I don't know how it will unravel, but uh, it's, it's very interesting to see quantum in, uh, in the federal budget. That's a good one. Uh, Jasmine. Um, I think for me, I mean, there was so much, it, a lot of it was really interesting. Um, I thought that the piece around um, disaggregated data action plan or the data collection, the 172 million towards that was really interesting and super important. And again, it reflects the federal government listening to all of these calls for disaggregated data collection and race-based data in, in, in lots of different fields, not just in health. And so I thought that was a really um, important, like, nugget of, of, for me at least, that really resonated with me. Great. Um, Colin? Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, you know, a slightly different tact at this. So as much as I, I was going to highlight, you know, the Canada workers benefit, but I'm glad that question came up. But the other thing I'm going to add to is, is, is the old age security expansion. And I don't say that in necessarily a positive light. And I say that because, you know, look, like it's, it's a, it's going to be a $3 billion sort of annual spend going forward, the expansion to those old age security to those age 75 and up who have means or who don't. I mean, and, and, and that's $3 billion at the end of the day. The question we'd be asking ourselves is what could that have otherwise been spent upon? The Canada Workers Benefit expansion I mentioned was $1.8 billion. The OAS expansion is almost nearly double that amount. And, and, and really for what economic and social objective? You know, and, and I think that those questions have to be asked. And I think that these are the kind of concerning questions that you get into when you get into situations whereby you knock by your, 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 your fiscal targets, you knock by your fiscal anchors, and then you might have been situations where you, you, you don't even have to justify this kind of spending, even though 
you could have doubled the, the size of the workers benefit expansion, you know, um, with the same with with that kind of money. Thank you. And Shal, we're in our last minute. What, what would you highlight? So on a more po positive note, uh, maybe it's the Montrealer in me, but the $200 million to support major festivals. Um, so <laughs> looking forward to Francophonie this summer if we're not living under a curfew. Um, but more generally, there's a lot of money in there for culture. Uh, and that's a, a, a domain, a sector that has been hit very, very hard by the pandemic. Uh, so more generally, just the recognition of that in, in the budget. Well, thank you to all four of you, Jasmine, Shao, Natalia, and Colin, um, and to all the IRPP team, which you don't see behind the scenes that made this webinar possible. Thank you to all of you out there watching. Um, if you observe Ramadan, I wish you a happy and peaceful month. Um, you're going to see a link uh, to a poll. So please fill out the poll to tell us how we did today. And if you want to know about more events, I'm very sorry we're not having the usual in-person events that we that we uh, generally have, but um, follow the IRPP on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook to find out about future events. I hope to see you again. Thank you to Jasmine, Charles, Colin, and Natalia, our panelists, and to our moderator, Jennifer. And a special thank you to our sponsor, Admari Bio Innovations. Thank you all for your participation and stay tuned to our social channels for future RPP webinars.